prot unumakas, sia presiris ohis, sagon unatsahas. Welcome back, everyone. It's Charlie. This will be my full House of the Dragon episode 5 video. There's a whole bunch of Easter eggs and references, so we'll break it all down. If you're brand new to the channel, I'm doing videos for all the episodes. Be sure to subscribe to get them all. Careful for spoilers if you have not seen the episode yet, but it was basically like our next big Game of Thrones wedding episode. Now, obviously, this is House of the Dragon, but it's the Game of Thrones universe, and you cannot have a wedding in the Game of Thrones universe without something bad going on. But as far as weddings go, this was actually pretty tame. Like, Rob Stark's wedding was pretty tame, even though he died during the red wedding. But if we're talking about royal weddings, I think Joffrey's purple wedding would probably be more apropos. But we'll start at the beginning of the episode and go through shot by shot, talking about Easter eggs and WTF moments as we go along, starting with the episode title, We Light the Way, which is a reference to the motto of House Hightower, a reference to the lighthouse in Old Town, the Old Tower where the seat of their house actually is which they reference later in the episode, metaphorically and literally. Like, Lara Strong literally mentions the light in the lighthouse. Like, do you know what color it burns when they march to war? It burns green. As Alicent walks into the throne room for the wedding banquet wearing the green dress, her trademark green dress that she's seen wearing throughout the rest of the timeline, both of the different factions in the Dance of the Dragon are called the blacks and the greens for the colors of the gowns that the two wear. So the whole idea is that during the episode, during the wedding, Allison is basically throwing the gauntlet at Rhaenyra. Like, she's lit the war fires at House Hightower. One of the other huge things in this episode, too, is this is the last episode with the young versions of the actresses. When we get to episode 6, there'll be, like, a really big time jump, and we'll have the older versions. I think they said it'd be about 10 years or so goes by. Like, this is meant to be the older version of Aegon. I'll do a separate trailer video for episode 6 tomorrow. They released a whole bunch of brand new footage. I've already done one, so I'll link it below in the description. It has some new footage. The other one that they just released also has even more new footage from episode 6. As far as I could tell, there weren't any big changes to the opening title scene. Usually they only change it when there are new heirs, when there are new children born to the people in the line of succession. Like you see new lines of blood come out of the special symbols. So because so many children are born in the next couple of years, between now and episode 6 and that big time jump, they'll probably update the opening title sequence for episode 6. The actual opening scene is sort of like a small film in and of itself that takes place up at Runestone in the Vale on the coast, and we meet Rhea Royce for the first time. Classic Game of Thrones, introduce a big character that you've been talking about for a long time and then just swiftly kill them right off the show. She's been married to Damon for a while, he was forced to marry her, he wasn't really happy about it, and it also sounds like she wasn't very happy about it either because she spends most of their conversation just making fun of him, and it seems like she knows about all the things that he said earlier in the timeline making fun of people in the Vale, like, yeah, you said that we all do it with sheep up here. Did your brother kick you out of court again? Because this is the second time he'd been banned. So the whole joke here is that he'd been calling her the bronze bitch, talking about her like she was this terrible person, but really she's fairly attractive, she seems pretty normal, and she just really does not like him because he's being kind of a terrible person. The person she meets with her cousin here, Gerald Royce, is probably the person who's going to inherit Runestone eventually. They mention Lady Jane, like Damon says he's gonna go claim Runestone. Oh, well she died, we didn't have heirs, so all of her holdings passed to me on her death. The big heel turn at the end of this episode is meant to be a metaphor for the way the Dance of the Dragon sort of spins up. Like, for a brief hot second, it seems like Rhaenyra and Daemon are going to get everything that they want. But then metaphorically, at the end of the episode, it's meant to show you how things take a sharp left turn. And it won't wind up ending the way that they think it will. So I think that's a good way to explain what's probably going to happen with Daemon and Runestone. The Lady Jane that Gerald mentions when he's trying to take him to task, accuse him of murdering Rhea Royce, is Jane Aaron, the current lady of House Aaron, like the leader of the Vale. So anytime you did anything really big like that, like try to claim titles or something like that, you'd have to plead your case with her. And it sounds like she probably won't be a big fan of Damon as well either. They also had like a Game of Thrones season 7 level transition, like really crazy transition going on here too. Going from that rock that he kills her with to the fish getting its head chopped off remind you of the transitions when they introduced Samwell at the Citadel at the beginning of season 7 with the way that they would cut between like the grossest scenes possible. But as we see Viserys and Rhaenyra heading to high tide on Driftmark to propose the marriage to Corlys Valerian to arrange how everything's going to work, they introduce brand new Valerian theme music for their house, which they play a couple times in the episode. Later when Rhaenys and Laner are riding their dragons back to the Red Keep, and then later again when they enter the throne room for the wedding banquet. And even though Viserys is very sick, many times in the episode they remind you how sick he is, like his declining condition. I think the reason why he's sick at sea here is just because he's poor at traveling at sea. I don't think he's getting sick because of his actual ailment. I talked about this in my last video, but the actor, Patty Considine, actually clarified what his actual sickness is, like what is actually killing him. 
He's actually suffering from a form of leprosy, so it's not some crazy plot with someone trying to kill him by poisoning the Iron Throne and him cutting himself. But him cutting himself, him hurting himself, is making it worse. It's just that this actual leprosy is what's really killing him. We meet Laner Valerian with Joffrey Lonmouth in the yard, and they give you a bigger introduction to Joffrey Lonmouth before they promptly kill him off during the wedding banquet, or Kristen Cole kills him off. But if you're not a big book reader, basically the whole idea is they've been lovers for a long time. And the way they talk about it later, Corliss Valerian, his father, thinks that it's something that he's going to get over. Like, oh, you know, he'll, he'll get married to Rhaenyra. He'll get over all that stuff. To make a very Game of Thrones reference, his mother, Rhaenys, is more worried about him being thrown to the lion's den with all the drama that's happening over the Battle of the Succession. Like, our son is going to be in danger. You're putting him in the firing line here. When Corlys Valerian says his whole aim here is to put a Valerian on the Iron Throne and he's doing that because he wants justice, he's talking about justice for his house because they come from ancient Valeria. Like they're a very old, very powerful house. They came to Westeros before the Targaryens did. But the whole idea is that because their family weren't dragon lords in ancient Valeria, they had to take to the sea to earn their living, even though they obviously became one of the wealthiest families in Westeros. The whole idea is that Corlys Valerian wants recognition for all of his family's great deeds all these many, many years. So that's what's going on with them haggling over the terms of the actual arrangement. Like, what is the last name that the children will go by? Well, we'll call them Valerian, but the minute that their son takes the Iron Throne, he's going to be using the Targaryen name. When Viserys says dragons have ruled the last hundred years, they'll rule the next hundred years, the next hundred years puts them around a point in the timeline when there were no actual dragons. Like, the last dragon died, and then for a period, there were no dragons until Daenerys were born. So he's not wrong, it's just like this is a really sad connotation to what he's saying, like the next hundred years and then there aren't gonna be any dragons for a long time until a girl comes along and then there'll be three. You also notice that when Corliss Valerian is talking about what happened to Damon and Rhea Royce, there's this hint of doubt in his voice, like he also kind of thinks that Damon probably killed her too. That'll be interesting because it seems like Lena Valerian now, who's much older, obviously very headstrong, is pursuing a marriage with Damon, it seems like. Like, oh no, you're single again, why don't we get married now? I'll talk about her a little bit more in a second too. They give us a really quick tour of the High Tide Castle. We'll probably see more of it later in the timeline. The reason they called the throne room here in High Tide the Hall of Nine is because it's named for the nine voyages of Corlys Valerian the Sea Snake. There's a very famous story about his voyages that they were actually going to do a spin-off for at one point. I don't know if they're still doing it, but that's what that's a reference to. Like all these great journeys that he went on and acquired all these treasures from them. So like some of this stuff is from the very far east. The big mural on the wall that you may have seen a couple times is basically meant to tell the history of their family going back to ancient Valyria. The other big reveal here too is Rhaenyra and Laenor coming to an agreement, quote unquote, like gentlemen's agreement, we will both let each other do whatever we feel like doing inside this marriage. It's just a political marriage. They make all these metaphors about the things that they like to eat, like you'll continue eating whatever you like to eat. I'll continue eating whatever I like to eat. We know what's going on here. The big surprise here with Kristen Cole and Rhaenyra on the way back is that he actually does try to get her to run away to Essos with him. Like, just leave it all behind, forget about the Iron Throne, all this stuff. We'll go be together over in Essos. And basically what's happening here is that Rhaenyra is asking him to live without honor, and that's his whole thing. Like, all he ever wanted was to be a knight. It's a very Brienne Game of Thrones type of thing later in the timeline. All she ever wanted to do was become a knight. As he says later, his honor is basically all he has to his name, and she's kind of traipsing all over it like, you know what? Just forget about the rules. The rules don't apply to me. I'm going to be the heir. I'll be the queen of the seven kingdoms. So it's one of those situations where they want to show you that there's really no right person in this whole Dance of the Dragons. Like, both the sides have a lot of terrible people. Like, Rhaenyra is doing a bunch of terrible things. The rules don't apply to me. I'm a Targaryen. We're above the rules. I'm going to be the heir which is mostly what Alicent is pissed off at her about for the way that she seemingly flaunts the rules and tries to get away with all this stuff and the way she boldface lied to her about what happened and kind of throws Alicent's honor under the bus too because the whole idea is that Alicent went to bat for her claiming that she never could have lied like puts her honor on the line for Rhaenyra. We also get the scene with Larys Strong cozying up with Alicent spilling all that tea. He's like Lord T spilling tea all over the Red Keep basically telling her that Rhaenyra was given moon tea, not whether or not she took it, but that she was given the moon tea. Still lots of theories about who the father of her first child is going to be. His metaphor about the flower from Bravos thriving in the Red Keep in this foreign territory is meant to be a metaphor for Alicent herself, but also kind of a metaphor to him. And even though his family is already in this position of power, what he's trying to do here is cozy up with her so that should Aegon II take the Iron Throne, he'd be in a much stronger position. So he's mostly doing this for himself. I don't think his father would have told him to do this because this kind of leads to the Dance of the Dragons. 
like Allison would have continued to back Rhaenyra. But then Allison gets Kristen Cole to confess to the truth of what happened. And that's when she starts to get pissed at Rhaenyra. Like she throws the gauntlet down wearing the green dress. And that's basically like the beginning of the end for real for their relationship. And when he talks about his punishment, gelding him, torturing him is what they would normally do to a Kingsguard who did something like that. When people become Kingsguard, they take a vow of chastity. So regardless of who he slept with, he'd be in really big trouble no matter what. But a Kingsguard sworn to protect the royal family, sleeping with a member of the royal family would really get it. So when he says, please take mercy on me by just giving me a regular death, that would be a mercy. Normally his punishment would be way, way worse. They show you more of Viserys' ailment. Like I said, he has leprosy. It's just getting worse and worse and worse. The special vial that they give him is milk of the poppy to help him sleep, quote unquote. You have to imagine that there's going to be like a 10 year time jump at the beginning of episode six. Think about how worse he's going to be by then if he's this bad now. And when he asked Lionel Strong how history is going to remember him as a king, the maesters mostly recorded him as being a weak king whose poor decisions and lack of ability to make decisions directly caused the Dance of the Dragons, so history isn't super kind to him. They play the new House Valerian theme music again as they introduce you to Rainey's dragon, Meles. Her dragon is also referred to as the Red Queen because of the color of the dragon. And we've already seen Laner's dragon, Sea Smoke, back in episode three. And the thing with the dragons on House of the Dragon, they're meant to be 17 total by the end of the series, but we're only going to see about nine of them this season. They said they tried to make all the dragons look very distinct, have different personalities, but both Laner and Rainey's dragons look similar to the types of dragons that Daenerys had. So a lot of people always ask, are Daenerys' dragons descended directly from one of the dragons that we'll see on House of the Dragon? And that could be the case. The wedding banquet happens in the Iron Throne room. All the great houses enter. They have that funny moment with the Lannisters, like Jason Lannister walks up and kind of gets dissed by Rhaenyra. Like, yeah, remember I turned you down earlier? And then he also makes fun of her in front of Viserys. We meet Gerald Royce setting up the drama with Daemon Targaryen later, entering the throne room as well, kind of shocking everyone. Like, haha, bet you didn't think you'd see me here. And I love how loaded this whole wedding scene is. Now, obviously, Game of Thrones weddings make all the red wedding, the purple wedding jokes you want. But metaphorically, what's happening here is that Viserys has all these grand plans for the future of the realm that he's set forth, but there's all this really shady stuff going on underneath the table, so to speak, like everybody's breaking the rules in really crazy ways, doing really shady stuff. And interrupting the speech about his grand plans is Alicent basically walking in, throwing the gauntlet, metaphorically, wearing the green gown. As Lair Strong calls out, like, oh, she is definitely coming for her. When he says there'll be seven days of tournament and feasting to celebrate the wedding, the tournament is actually when the maesters later in the timeline date the origin of the actual Dance of the Dragons in the blacks versus the greens, like the gowns that the two of them wore. But I think the whole idea is, is the actual Dance of the Dragons won't really get going to like season two or maybe like the very end of season one. This dwarf character in the back playing with the band might be a version of Mushroom from the books. In the books, Fire and Blood is written from the perspective of an old maester and the court fool who was called Mushroom, who was just always hearing all this gossip because nobody took him really seriously or a big threat, so they just had looser lips when he was around. So we just wind up hearing way more gossip, and they've kind of given that storyline to Lara Strong, like he is the person with all the tea. When they start their dance, this is also a big metaphor for the Dance of the Dragons, like the gauntlet is being thrown between Allison and Rhaenyra, that's happening in the background, but also Rhaenyra and Laenor are both dragon riders and they are dancing, so the whole dance is just loaded with meaning. Also, when she starts dancing with Daemon, they're two dragon riders, they're two dragons, so to speak, so it's like the dance of these dragons. Lots of dragons doing a lot of dancing on this week's episode. During the dance, she also makes a reference to the outcome, and that's also meant to be a metaphor for what will eventually happen, like the outcome of the Targaryen Civil War. This whole scene with Gerald Royce and Daemon Targaryen is meant to be kind of a mirror for the scene with Rhaenyra and Kristen Cole, where Daemon basically plays this whole thing like he's above the rules, like how dare you challenge me? If someone in King's Landing tried to slander me, they'd be forced to pay for their crimes. Like he threatens Gerald Royce's life for even suggesting that he killed his wife. So just like Rhaenyra felt like she was above the rules, like she wasn't beholden to all this honor, all these rules that Kristen Cole was talking about, Damon's doing the same thing. So it's just meant to show you the dark side of their characters, like they're both kind of being terrible people. I mentioned Lena Valerian. This is obviously a much older version of the character now. I don't know if she's already started riding her dragon. I believe she has. So hopefully there'll be a scene in episode six where we'll see that. But I think because of the big time jump, she might be played by an older version of the actress. The whole idea here, though, is they just want to show you that she's a little more headstrong. Like, she actually pursues Damon, probably knows about all the stuff that he's been getting up to, too. Like, she understands. She's not completely naive in all this. 
I think she's supposed to be kind of rebellious, but not quite as bad as Rhaenyra when it comes to stuff like that. Like she's got a little bit of bad girl inside her too. Then I think the whole idea with Joffrey Lonmouth and Kristen Cole is that when he figures out that he's the guy that Rhaenyra is with, and he tries to make the deal with him, like, let's protect their secrets because it'll just be better for all of us. That's just what causes Kristen Cole to snap, and that's why he starts the fight and the brawl breaks out. Even though we don't see the opening blows, like, you only see the actual fight once it's been going on for a second. I think the whole idea is that he had the conversation with him, then walked off, and then eventually Kristen Cole just snapped and went after him. Really important detail here, too. When the fight is breaking out, they lose sight of Rhaenyra. Lionel Strong looks at his son Harwin Strong and gives him the signal to save Rhaenyra. There were a couple scenes earlier where you saw the two of them dancing. I think this is just foreshadowing the idea that he is going to replace, quote unquote, Kristen Cole, metaphorically and literally, in all senses of the word. So everybody start your strong boys theories. We'll talk about that when I do my next episode six trailer video. Because in the episode six trailer, you actually hear the older version of Allison making references to the strong boys from the books. The fact that the father of her children might be someone other than her husband. They also have the whole scene with Damon talking to Rhaenyra, trying to talk her out of getting married to Lena. Like, he's going to bore you to death. Don't do this. Because he still wants to marry her because he wants the Iron Throne. And right now he feels like that's the best way to do it. That's also the reason why he killed his wife. Because he wants to get her out of the way so he can remarry and the king will allow it. But he also wants to marry Rhaenyra because she's the current heir. And funny side note too, we post all the memes. But this scene is like the Game of Thrones version of the distracted boyfriend meme. With Rhaenyra dancing with Harwin Strong, clocking Damon, who's talking to Lena Valerian about them getting married. Obviously, at the end of the brawl, Kristen Cole winds up beating Joffrey Lama to a bloody pulp. He's dead. And you have Lena Valerian just crying over his lover's dead body. Also trying to bite back the tears while they rush their wedding ceremony. Like, okay, let's just do this right now and get it out of the way. So if it wasn't clear, they are married now, like the deed has been done. But the meaning shouldn't be lost on you that Viserys collapses immediately after they finish the wedding ceremony. Like the clock is ticking, King is going to die any moment now. And I love the way they juxtapose Kristen Cole in the Godswood trying to kill himself until Allison saves him. I think the whole idea, like to make the metaphor, she lights the way for him, like to make a metaphor to their house motto. She helps him regain his honor slowly, but they don't start a relationship or anything like that. Like it's not quite so spicy as that. Her whole thing is that she's very prim and proper. She follows the rules. That's also part of the reason why she's mad at Rhaenyra because Rhaenyra lied to her. Like they were meant to be real close friends and she lied to her. Also, they may have had some kind of relationship between the two of them as the actresses imply, but also because Rhaenyra is flaunting the rules in a way that Allison doesn't think that she should be able to. So it's not like Allison is going to turn around and start a relationship with Kristen Cole or anything like that. That's not what's going on between the two of them. But it was actually a pretty short episode for House of the Dragon so far. Most of the episodes have been a little bit longer than an hour. This felt a little bit shorter than that. Just a real quick Game of Thrones shotgun wedding. If you spotted any other Easter eggs or references in the episode that I didn't mention in the video, just write them below in the comments. In my episode 6 trailer video we'll post tomorrow, they have a whole bunch of brand new footage. So I'll talk about what's happening with that big time jump and who all those new actors are playing. My full episode 6 video will post next week after they release it too. Make sure you enable alerts for my channel so you don't miss that. Everyone click here for my House of the Dragon episode 6 trailer video. I'll update the link as soon as I post that. And click here for all my other House of the Dragon videos. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe and I'll see you guys in the next one.